But this afternoon, I want us to think about this subject, the Socratic shepherd. And I'm, I'm not sure if you would even put those two words together normally prior to now, but I hope from now on or from today, for you, they will have special meaning. I want to begin by reading just one or two verses uh, from scriptures, Proverbs chapter 18 and 13. Just one verse, which says, He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. And I'm sure you've met some people like that who answer before you've actually finished. You know, they're sitting, waiting, waiting to get into the conversation, and they haven't actually listened to you at all. And then in Proverbs 20, Verse 5 says, The purposes of a man's heart are deep waters, but a man of understanding draws them out. And what I really want to think about for a little while is just this idea of how we might enable our conversations that we have to be really significant. I begin by telling you a story. It's a young man and who was rather awkward and was married to someone who was connected in her work with lots of people who are, as we would say sometimes, pretty high flyers. And so he felt really, mm, I'll not really get on very well at this social function because I'm not socially that good, you know, I'm, I, I'm not brilliant at engaging with people. And uh, then I'm not, I really don't know all of her friends, but I'll go anyway. But on the way to this event, someone gave him a piece of advice and said, you know, if you were to change the way you approach this, it could turn out very different for you. And they said, instead of you going in there to try and talk to people, go in there and try to listen to people. And he said he felt totally comfortable with that because he could listen and he didn't mind listening. And if he could ask a couple of questions, he could maybe keep the listening process going on. So that night, he just listened, asked the odd appropriate question to the odd person that he was with, and people started opening up their lives to him. Now, he hadn't a clue about their specialization, but they wanted to talk about it. And whenever the evening was over, he was going home and his wife said, you know, my friend said you were amazing. My friend said you were wonderful and I want to get to know you. And all of a sudden he discovered that he himself had become, in their eyes, a very different person than he even was in his own. Now, it is, of course, possible to use every gift that we have in a, in a deceptive way. Our fallen hearts can use every good gift in the wrong way so that you can understand how someone like that could actually think, well, you know, I could use this to my advantage and I would look well before people, but that's not really what it's about. When we come with a heart that has been touched by Jesus and in our lives, we already have everything we need. We're not coming to any conversation to get from that person something else. Really, we don't need that if we remember that Jesus has everything for us. So that indeed in every relationship we're in, because we believe that, know that to be true, that he has won for us through his life, his death, and his resurrection and ascension, he has won for us everything we need. So that as we read in, in 2 Peter, all things for life and godliness are ours through Christ. So as we interact with people, we don't come to draw from them and drain them. You know how people can do that? You feel drained from some people? We don't come to do that. We come able to be free, to be helpful, to be an instrument in some measure of God in their lives. And so that's where this idea of the Socratic following Socrates, who lived 430 BC, but who was that from whom we have got the idea of the Socratic method, the method of drilling into the person's life through questions. And we bring the shepherd, and we bring these two together. And so that's really what we're going to think about for, for a little while this afternoon, is how we can blend together these two, as it were, these two ideas and from the so Socrates, we have the question. From the shepherd, we have the motivation. We have the reason why we do it. This is a skill and a gift 
and, and this is a vocation, as it were. And, and we're all called to, in the body of Christ, to pastor one another, really. So while some of us may have specialist gifts and specialist callings, if we're pastors, like that's what I've been doing for, it's about 37 years now, that is my vocation. But I will always do, have to do that because I'm a Christian. And you and I, wherever our role is, we still have the sense of pastoring one another. So thinking, how can I be better at that? How can I be someone who blending these things together, I can really make a significant contribution to the relationships that God has put me in. And this doesn't have to be many relationships. In fact, I, another little principle that I try to encourage myself to live by and others is to concentrate on the depth and to leave the breadth up to God. And you know the way this works in a room, you go into a room and there's lots of people and you know one or two, or you maybe know a few, and you're tempted to try to speak to everybody, you know? But when you start to think like this, you concentrate on giving yourself to the one or the two people that you meet. And you, give, and you don't give in to the temptation to talk a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here and a little bit there. But you say, Lord, thank you. Here is this person and I will give myself to this person. And it may actually mean that in doing that, that you locate yourself in the room in a certain way. So you may come in this way and everybody's in front of you. But if you're thinking, you'll slowly move yourself to a point where you're actually away from all the other people and you're giving your attention to that one person. And they know that that's important because you've made them important. You've made them the center of your, your moment there. You're concentrating on the depth. And you're not worried about whether you see everybody. Now, you can understand the challenge of this to people who are working in Christian ministry because they feel, I, I need to think about everybody. You don't. You don't. There's nowhere in the scripture it says you're meant to do everything for everybody. But we are meant to do some things for somebody and to make those things significant. So that's why when we think about putting these two things together, we're thinking about trying to learn how to be pastorally concerned for each other, but in such a way that we use the Socratic method, which is developing the capacity to listen and to inquire those two things, things that we actually don't need to work at to actually, you know, we do them all the time. We do them without thinking. In fact, you come, as soon as you meet someone, usually it begins with a question, doesn't it? In these last few days here at ELF, I'm sure people have met you. They look at your badge to get a kind of, a, you know, and they see your name and they say, oh, right. And, and if, they're, if they're quick on it, they try and make sure they see your first name so they can actually speak to you as a person. So I see Daniel, and I say, ah, hi, Daniel. And if I said that to Daniel on the street, he'd say, how do you know my name? But anyway, Daniel knows, at least I paid attention, and I say, so Daniel, you know, um, what are you doing here? And that's a simple question. It hasn't gone very deep. Uh, my next question might be, and I'm sure you've heard people say, well, tell me, where have you come from? And you tell them your country, your city, and so on. And you develop a little bit of knowledge, not very much. And then if somebody turns and says to you, tell me, how, how, how have you been doing today? Not how are you, but how are you today? Then you think, oh, you're not just saying hello. You're actually interested in me as a person. And Many a time when someone asks a question like that, we have to double take because they say, you really want to know how I'm doing today? Today? And, and the word today I've added to that question because in the past I used to ask people how they were until I read a book by a girl who had cancer. And she said, people kept asking me how I was. I couldn't tell them how I was because my day was, every day was so different. One day I could be really sick. The next day I could be doing okay, but every day was so different. And she said, I learned this idea, why not just ask people, how are you doing today? Because it kind of gives a little bit of definition to it and it brings it, narrows the focus. So we ask questions normally from one another, but think about this. What is it that makes us good at asking questions? And we've already covered that. 
What makes good questions? Good questions are the key to unlocking what's going on inside people's lives. And there's a, there's a really important way here and reason for this. As a pastor, I visit people. I don't do as much of the kind of house to house to house as I used to do years ago, but I, I'm more strategic about the way I do that today. I, I arrange it, I make appointments, I plan ahead and so forth. But in the past, you go to visit somebody and you realize, I have a certain amount of time here in my day. You know, or most of our lives are limited and, uh, and time for the day and busy and so forth. And you're trying to think about, do you know, if I go in here, what am I going to say and what are we going to talk about? We pray about our conversations. But then you start to think about, well, if I go in, I'm going to, I'm going to learn. I, I want to unlock the real issues in this person's life. I am a pastor, after all. I'm not just having a social call to find out, you know, just kind of general information. I really do want to show that I care for this person and I want to help this person. And a lot of people don't know what to say to us. <laughs> but if we can figure out what are the questions to ask them, we will facilitate them to start to say things that really matter. And we will have conversations of significance that leave the person that we've just left thinking, that was really helpful. That allowed me to say things, that allowed me to go deeper, that allowed me maybe to get to places that I've never got to with other people. And you know, the interesting thing with this is, when we start to work a little bit at this type of way of engaging with people, every relationship that we're involved in can be changed. But there's so many relationships that are just superficial. You know that. Even marriages have become so superficial because there's no real question of significance going on there. And, 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 and so therefore, the, we live at this kind of level and we never go deep. And then we don't, we sort of seem to, you know, what's, 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 the, what's the meaning of that relationship where we don't actually go deep to get to know what people think and how they feel and so on. So if we're thinking then about what questions and what makes a good listener, first of all, I want you to just to suggest this to me. Think about it. Just take a moment and think about it. There are people who listen to you and you know you would go and talk to them because they're really good listeners. And you may have watched the little clip about stop it, you know, stop it. And sometimes we just need to hear that. Stop it. Don't do that. And uh, start something else instead. So those are some of the things. Good listener. Good listener for me. I had a few other ones. Withholding judgment. Now, you mentioned not interrupting, but it's a little bit like taking that on a little further because if you think about it, withholding judgment is actually not yielding to the temptation when something you hear that really, whoa, I got I to gotta, I gotta come in there. Do, don't worry about it. Just let it go. Just let it all, whatever. I mean, you may hear, you may hear some really difficult things. And especially if someone's going to say things about you that you don't like to hear, you know? You may want to, in mid-course, you may want to get up your defense and get your inner lawyer out to start speaking for you. And I'm sure you've felt yourself in that place, you know, you know, and they've started to say something to you and you say, and immediately you feel annoyed. And I say, well, hold on a minute. But let me finish. Isn't that what they often people say? Would well, just let me finish. Or you try to finish their sentences for them. I mean, that's really, really annoying, isn't it? If somebody finishes your sentences for you or answers for you. Well, that's so annoying. For that is really, you talked about respect. That's so disrespectful of that person if you try to finish. It's as though they don't know how to do it. So those are simple little things. Reflecting, I think someone mentioned that. You reflect back to people, which shows that you've been paying close attention to what they're saying. You reflect that back. You know, did I really hear you say this? Is this what you mean? You know, that's reflecting that back to the person. And I think that's very helpful. Sometimes clarifying, you know, you, because you're, you're saying, you know, after you show you've really listened to someone whenever you can clarify it. You know, you can summarize it, you can clarify it. And they, yeah, thanks, that's what I mean. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to say, which shows that you're really listening. And so, good. But let's, let's think then about 
listening with more than just our ears. I think you made reference to this, David, and you were talking about our eyes. And I think it really is important, you know, when we're listening, because sometimes it's not just our ears. As you, we, we do listen with our whole bodies and with all our senses, as it were. And so the whole idea of where we position ourselves in regard to a person is very important. You know, we, we think about that. And so sometimes it'll actually mean if you're sitting with someone, you may move forward in a seat. You know, you may actually physically move yourself forward six inches towards a person to show, I'm really, I'm really taking you in. So our senses, uh, what looking is crucial, really paying attention, you know, obviously listening, um, avoiding distractions. Also, I think inviting expressions, you know, I have, there have been sometimes I've been in a situation where I'm very, very close to falling asleep. You know, especially when you have to listen to somebody saying something that you find really boring. Like in a seminar like this, maybe, or something, you know. Have you ever been in that there and you're really struggling to stay awake? You know, and the temperature goes up and all the rest of it. That's why I try to have a few pictures sometimes, because at least there's something to watch, if nothing to hear. But, but you know, the idea of our, our whole expression shows if we're listening, because we listen with our whole face, don't we? You know, and you, you, you're, you, you know, you're actually, you know, I can see if you're listening now or not. And I can see if you're actually listening, just, well, we'll see how this goes. Or you're actually saying, yeah, I really want to hear what you're saying. It's in our faces. It's really there. And so these are little simple things. But, you know, if you're struggling in your marriage, your husband says you never listen, or your wife says you never listen, and you go back home, and you try, you try to work at some of this here, it'll change your relationship. But it'll change all of the relationships we are engaged in with people. Because we make that person, that moment, that time significant. So that I say, I'm not just coming into the office just to grab a cup of coffee. And by the way, yes, what was that you said? I set the cup down, I go over and I sit down and I, on the outside of the desk where we are and I say, yeah, tell me that again. I missed the first part of that. What was that you said about such and such? Okay. Hmm. I ponder it. But they know that all of a sudden I am really there to listen. And, and that's very important. So I, I think that this is this simple, simple thing. And I think the other thing that's really important is that we give, that we, that we express patience by giving people time. Patience. You and I know when somebody's in a hurry and they're not going to, you're not going to say anything to somebody that's in a hurry, are you, really? Unless it's something you really want to get them to listen to you and it's not that urgent, but it's not maybe deep, but you know, you want to say it. But, but if you really want to help someone to say something, you've got to express patience. I am giving you my time and I'm not in a rush. And if I can't give that person that time, aren't we much better to say, look, let me come back when we've got proper time. Or look, later on tonight, well, we, we can take a proper time and sit down. I really want to hear what this was all about. So that we're actually serious about it. We really want to give them proper dignity and saying, this is important. And whenever we do it that way, then all of a sudden we'll start to see things change in, that, in the nature of that relationship. And this is not just about counseling. We're not talking about counseling. We're just talking about the everyday things. The same rules apply to counseling, only there are some specific things. And we're going to move on to a little bit of that just now. I think for me, one of the things that's really important about, about listening is learning to ask good questions. And I'm sure you have got a fair idea of the sort of things we're talking about. When you've mentioned those different things earlier on about eye contact and reflecting back and active listening, you've obviously been thinking about this, but there are a whole range of different types of questions, and we'll have a look at some of them. I put them down in a, a little group because I think that, that they are Types of questions here, and, and you'll, you can you can populate 
endless things. But when we talk about funneling, you know what a funnel is? It starts broad at the top and it narrows down to the bottom. And the whole idea is in our questions, questions that narrow the issue. Each time we go a little deeper with that question, we start at the outside, but then we start to get closer in, closer in, closer in until we get to the heart of the matter. And the reason we do that is because sometimes people really don't know, they don't know what it is. You're actually leading them along by the question. So in a pastoral sense, you know, say they're struggling with something. It could start out like, I feel really sad some days, you know. And you say, well, you know, well, have you any idea why you might feel sad? And they say, no, I have no idea. We say, does it happen a lot? Does it happen at certain times? You know, you start to ask questions. You're, you're moving in a direction where you're really helping them to find the answer themselves, if you think about it, you know. And, and you're not really making them, sometimes it can seem so hard, the questions have to be gentle and simple and that they can answer. Because sometimes we ask a question that, they, I don't know, how would I ever know the answer to that? But so we're sort of funneling, we're starting on the outside and we're working our way in. And that's really helpful to do that. So some questions are just like that. Some are for clarification. Well, when you say that, do you mean this? Well, yes, I do, or maybe I don't. So what do you mean? When, when you talk about being angry, what do you mean? When, when you talk about being sad, what do you mean? You know, and, and asking a question for clarification. Now, once you start to see these types of questions, you realize this is not just a, a mere trivial conversation. You've now moved into the position where you're really listening to someone, but that's because it's pastoral. This is, this is having a pastor's heart for each other that's going a little deeper with people. We're not interrogating them, and it's very possible it's practically, that we could make it sound like an interrogation, but I think when we start to empathize with people, we realize that it's not interrogating them, you know, the empathy that comes back from us. Reflection is asking really, what do you, is that what you mean? You, you mentioned it earlier, reflect back. We act as a mirror to them so that when they say it, we say, right, do you mean this? Okay, and there'll be different ways in which we say these things to reflect things back to, to, to someone who's maybe chatting with us. And then, of course, there's a way of looking at emotions. You know, uh, and asking about feelings. But feelings are not everything, and sometimes people think feelings are. Feelings are yet, nonetheless, a very important part. I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that? You know, and that'll draw another whole, a whole other aspect of their life out. Feelings will come out. They'll give you their emotional response to something, which will be very different than whether they like it or they don't like it or, or what it was. It's, it's getting you to understand because as you listen, you hear what's going on inside their heart. And it's not what we want to do with people. We want to really try and understand what's going on inside a person's heart. Where is that feeling? And it's feelings that are often reflected. I mean, the scripture says that out of the fullness of the heart does the mouth speak. But some of the things we say are emotional things, and the emotional things reflect a lot of what's really going on inside our hearts. And that's really getting us a little bit deeper. Information, simply, is just asking those things, well, tell me about. Just tell me how that other night went. Tell me, what did they say? Tell me, just information. And a lot of our conversations, that's where they begin and end. But still, it's important. An evaluation um, is asking them to evaluate. Not a, you're not doing the evaluation. You're asking them, and you say, well, why is this a good thing? Why is that a bad thing? Why do you think that's a helpful thing? Why do you think that was unhelpful? Why do you think that was unfair? You're asking them to evaluate. So what we're really doing in those conversations is we're, we're really getting them to evaluate and work in their own hearts. But you can see how one, just one question, I mean, we, we may not use all of these, but just one question can turn a whole thing around, can open up the heart in such a way to say, oh, I now see something. 
And they will actually, maybe that person will start to say, well, actually, I now understand. I've got it now. I understand what it was. I don't need to talk anymore because they've actually discovered it with your help. You have assisted them to find out what was going on in their own hearts. And you just had to ask those few simple questions. And you weren't saying very much. You were doing the listening. And you were listening in such a way that you heard not just what was said, but what you thought was underneath it. So that you could get there. And I think that's, uh, again, that's really simple. Do you think when you're having a conversation with people that when they're about to say something that's, that is significant, you know, they're going to open a part of their, they're going to open a door, they maybe haven't done it before, or they haven't done it often, that you can sense, it's what we were saying earlier about being conscious of the Holy Spirit with you, that you can sense this is an important door here, you know, and therefore, you, you nearly sense it. It's like a bump on the road. And at that point, just what you've said, do you really want to go there right now? Where do you think this is going to lead us? What is this going to do to, this, to the next stage of this conversation? And, and I, I think that you know, when you consider Jesus and the way that he interacted with people, and he used questions all the time, he had, of course, the capacity to see into the heart before the person spoke, which we don't have because, you know, we know how in Scripture it says, and knowing what was in their hearts, he then said something. He asked them things. And I think we don't have that capacity, but I think we can sense sometimes this is difficult. In fact, I can think we can sense that for the majority of the times. But if you were in a situation where there were other problems, you know, maybe other personality disorders or other situations, you're conscious that you're not dealing with someone who's straightforward. Not that many of us are straightforward, but you know what I mean, as straightforward. Therefore, you realize that in those situations, all of these th things we're talking about need to be kind of ramped up in a different way. You know, it, they take on even more importance that we pay attention to the various things, the way in which we're listening. And, and therefore, um, I think in a situation like that, which I have sensed from time to time when someone, I'm with someone, and, I, and I've thought, if we go there, this might be the end of it. And we're not talking here about counseling, you know, Essentially, we're not talking about counseling. I'm talking about the Socratic shepherd, and the shepherd is essentially pastoring in, the, in a more generic sense. When we move into the act to another level altogether again of counseling, then that, there's a whole other range of questions because then we're, we start to deal with specific issues and people and types of issues, and how we deal with one will be very different than how we deal with another. And, and that requires a whole lot more skills and skill sets. But in the general sense, of dealing with the average routine and pastoral and so on, uh, there will still be those moments that we will come across, I think, and we will have to say to them most likely, and I think the way you say it is a very helpful, just say, do you really want to go here? And that's fine. Uh, we've all had people say things to us and say, you're the first person I've ever said that to. I'm sure you wouldn't, nearly everybody in this room have said, or maybe you've said that to somebody. You're the first person that I've said this to. And when they say that, you kind of think, do I, do I really want to carry this? You know? <laughs> but we ask the Lord to give us um, divine amnesia. That's what I pray for. Because some of the things people say are pretty heavy in life. And, and increasingly so because of the complexity of life. Um, people feel maybe it, there's more permission in our culture today to say things and even in, in the church. But if we develop a sort of a, a Socratic spirit to listening with good questions and a pastoral heart, we create the culture that allows people to speak. And, you know, underpinning all of this really is, 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 is a gospel understanding. Because the gospel gives you permission to be the worst that you are, and yet you're still accepted. And if you and I are gospel-hearted people, then we realize that and we say, well, it's okay. Whatever you say is okay. So that in a phrase we use sometimes, not in the way that it's always used by others, we can be open and accepting. 
Some people take open and accepting to be anything goes and it doesn't matter. That's open and affirming. But to be open and accepting is to say we are welcoming, we welcome whatever you want to say, and we accept you as you are. But we may not affirm it. So that if you just tell me you've just murdered your brother or your son, I'm hardly going to affirm it, but I will accept it right there and then, and then we'll work our way through it. Whatever else it may be, it'll not be like that, hopefully, ever. So when we create that culture, then we realize that, that whatever that person is going to say to us, it's going to be okay, in the sense that the gospel can bear the weight of that, even though we cannot. And, and that is what, because at the end of the day, the bigger issues in life, most issues, it's not about us anyway. We're merely there to be an instrument to help someone who will get help, gospel-hearted help, into their life. And really, the gospel addresses every aspect of our lives in some measure. How, how much should you say about yourself, really? Or should you say anything about yourself? Well, I think we have to all judge in the situation. It's a conversation is a little bit like tennis game, where the ball comes over the net, and then you put the ball back. You know, and how hard you hit the ball back will depend you know, on how, how intense this may well get. How much of yourself you put into that, how much weight of yourself you put into that, you will determine according to the game that you're in, as it were, if you know what I mean, the analogy of this. Uh, if you get the feeling that this is just, you know, we're just having a little hit back across the net, you know, it's fine, it's, you may feel, I don't need to invest too much. But there are those conversations where, like the Apostle Paul, we not only share the gospel, but we share our very selves. It's not saying that we're talking about ourselves, as it were, but we're actually, what we're doing is we're empathizing with them and say, you know, it may well be someone says something about um, a situation, say, well, I, you know, I do, I understand what you're saying because I was in the very same situation or in a very similar, because the, there are no two situations are the very same. Uh, and some people would quite feel quite offended if you said that. But, you know, I've been in a similar situation to that. And, and that may be all you need to say. They say, and they say, oh, I didn't know that. And then you may say, well, yes, actually, you know, I, you know, whatever it may be. In my case, for example, say something like, uh, I, I come from a broken home, a single parent family, you know, and today I meet lots of people and they're so angry and I have no dad, da dad, and all this here. And I say, well, actually, I, I didn't know my father until I was 40 years of age. And they think, oh, wow. Or I get people who are really angry, you know, about, uh, about the church and things and so on and ministry and all that's here. And I don't know, there's so much hypocrisy in the church. And I say, yeah, well, actually, my father went off with a girl 20 years younger than him, left my mom. He was the preacher. And you still go to church. I said, I'm the minister. Wow, you're a minister. I said, oh, that is a big story. I didn't want to be a minister <laughs> for, for, for various reasons, as you can imagine. But there are times whenever I will bring that out of my pocket but it's only when I think it's really necessary because I don't like the world to know that I'm, you know, all my mess. I don't mind. I mean, it's okay, but it's who I am. But Daniel, you will know in yourself, you'll say, and also you'll know the person you can trust, you know, because you're giving something pretty important to somebody of that. What will they do with that? Just as they're giving something to you. So I think that as the relationships that we have with people develop, we know how much we can do, and we will be really let down by everybody. There's no question, we'll be let down by everybody. We've most likely let most people down ourselves in some measure, you know, in relationships, and we know they're going to let us down. But I mentioned a couple of extra things, note-taking. You see, when we're having a conversation with somebody, and it does get to that level, you know, where you are moving a little deeper, uh, I do say to people, uh, I hope you don't mind, but I might need, I need to write something down here. And I say, uh, I'll forget. If I don't write these things down, I'll possibly forget. And I don't want to forget these things. So I write my notes down. And I've never had anybody say, oh, no, don't write it down. And if they do say to me, no, I don't want you to write anything down, I'm just thinking, oh, well, I'm not so sure about this. You know, I'm not so sure. And I don't mind if after I've written it down, they say, can I have a copy of it? I say, sure, you can have a copy. I don't mind. But I, writing down notes is really, really helpful. I know that you may be thinking, I never thought about taking it that seriously, but lots of the young friends I have who are pastors, I'm saying this to them all. 
write your notes, write your notes. Uh, my son-in-law is a pastor in the States, and, and he has encountered all sorts of very, very complex situations, especially today with the moral world and the world we're living in. He's encountered all sorts of difficulties. And I've, I said to him, you know, you must write down as you have conversation with these people. And, um, and then you will be able to know afterwards. And then next time you meet and you start to have a conversation about that issue, and this is slightly moving more into other aspects, but you're saying, well, last week you said this. And I wonder, you know, do you still think that? And that's a yes, no question, of course. But it is actually there. Oh, yeah, you remember that. Okay. And whenever a person knows you're going to write things down, it really makes them think about what they say. And they should think about what they say. Because it's a serious, you know, things, it's important. So note taking, I think, is really important. Have your own way to do it. I used to work in social work a long time ago, and it was absolutely essential that you had all your notes for everything that you did. And I think the practice in ministry, I've discovered with a lot of people, and they're so casual about it, they don't, and it's very, very unwise. So if you are in a situation where you're engaging with someone on a more long term and a more whatever, yeah, get the notes down, have them there, have your own system of organization. I don't write them on a computer. I'm a paper and pen person. And uh, the reason I do that, I think, is because I don't know what it is. I find if I'm sitting there typing away on a computer and somebody's talking to me, I, first of all, I couldn't even do that fast. I'm a two finger guy. I'm the wrong generation. And uh, I find I can write and I can talk and write and not give the per I still give the person my full attention. Or it may be you simply just say at the end of it, you know, you've, you know, you sit down, you summarize it at the end. But if you don't do it within a couple of hours, you'll most likely not get the story you'll miss it, you know. So, you know, it's about being serious, isn't it, about the conversations we have with people. And then what this means is that we don't, do as, don't have as many conversations. It goes back to the idea of it, concentrate on the depth. Don't try and, God hasn't sent us out into the world to do everything for everybody, and we'll not fix anybody anyway. We don't fix people. God fixes people. We just are there to facilitate as instruments, as Paul Tripp in his book said, we are instruments in the Redeemer's hands. That's what we are. And, and it's great to be, have the pressure off. <laughs> I think it's wonderful. Um, people's answers. <laughs> I just mentioned this because people's answers go from absolute outright lies to total truth and everything in between. And I do not ever say I believe everything people say to me. But I let them think, I believe everything they say to me. And you might think, oh, that's deceptive of you. Do you know what? We're, to we're called to be wise as servants and gentle as doves. And if you listen to everything everybody said and didn't have a sort of a some degree of critical analysis on it, you would realize they say in our part of the world, you'd, you'd eat everything you see. So, you know, the idea of being conscious that what people are saying is you have in your own head, you have a reserve always. This could be totally true, but this could be totally false. And, and, it's, and, and often it's only over a period of time, a fair period of time, that we will see whether that is really true or not. You know, the truth will come out in the end. And it's not necessary that it will come out because of what they say, but you'll see the inconsistencies in the things that, are being, that they've said. And because you've taken your notes, then you're able to go back, and then you're able to say, well, you know, you used to say this, and you remember on that day, maybe you don't remember, but let me remind you what we said that day. And you say, but I've noticed recently, you know, I've noticed recently this behavior or this, and I find I'm really struggling to understand. Could you help me understand that? And, and what you're really trying to do is play dead, you know? Playing dead, some animals are good at it, it's the way they survive, you know, and it's the way we survive in some of these complex situations. We play dead, we say, I have no idea, but do you know, I mean, you've done it with children. You know the way we do it with children whenever we know they've done something wrong, you know, and I just, I have no idea who it was, you know, pushed the fire alarm. I mean, I can't, I'm trying to think, maybe I did it, or maybe it was such and such, you know, I mean, 
and and you know you know you know what's going on and, and you know your own children or you know who it was that stuck the thing up and fused all the lights you know i mean we know that i can think back to a whole lot of things in our family we had two boys and two girls and you know there's a lot of mischief in, in our in our middle boy <laughs> he was always getting into bother he was just like his father and you know and i used to have to get the truth out <laughs> but play dead and i'll say hey what do you think you know i don't know i mean and he would you'd always get the truth eventually <laughs> So people's answers, I don't know if you, have you find that with people? Do you find that when you're dealing with people that sometimes you're taken in too easily? The, the principle I think in terms of all of this with regard to the pastoral side of the shepherd side is that it takes, a, it takes a human shepherd a long time to get to know their sheep. The Lord's my shepherd. He knows his sheep perfectly inside and out. <laughs> But it takes us a long time sometimes to get to know somebody. I think that's one of the, the lessons I've learned in my ministry is that what I thought, even after a year, could be totally wrong in two. People really, you know, it's not that they've changed necessarily, but I have not seen things. And, and I've, we have, I have, we have, we've made big mistakes. And, we, and we've had to pick the pieces up after it because of that. So just simply say, it does take a long time. And just finally, just something on, and it's not kind of like as a last minute type thing or anything, but no, this is crucial because when you look, come to look for the perfection in anything, you go to the perfect man. Jesus is the perfect man. And uh, if you're looking for what, what, is, what does it look like in any way, any human thing, the ultimate, you go to Jesus and you find it there. And so Jesus, the Holy Spirit is our counselor, as we were saying earlier, and Jesus is the perfect Socratic shepherd. And you can see that all throughout the gospel records. You can see how he, how he worked with people. I'll just give you a few little illustrations from the, the gospel in Mark. In Mark chapter 8, there are just a, a few little situations when we look at some of the ways in which Jesus used his questions in his conversations with his disciples. Um, I mean, there are simple things, you know, gathering information. <laughs> you know, Jesus knew so much. You think about it. Now, he obviously did restrain some of his divinity is restrained in his humanity. We know that. But he, he must have known all sorts of things, but in this Mark 8 is the situation of the, the, the uh, feeding of the 4,000 in this case. And in verse 5, it just he goes to the disciples and he says to them, simple thing, you know, he says, um, how many loaves do you have? I think Jesus knew how many loaves they had. But sometimes he asks questions to people for another reason other than for him to get the information. And sometimes, yeah, and maybe he asked that question to them just to let them realize how desperate they were. <laughs> We've only got four loaves, right enough. Four. Is it only four? You know what I mean? I don't know. How much money have you? You know, I think I've got money. But how much money have you, really? Oh, I've got, oh, do you know that? So that's not much. And so I'm, I'm, you know, Jesus does ask questions as simple as that. And so we shouldn't, we shouldn't sort of despise a simple question, gathering information. Correction, Margaret. And verse 21 there, he, he asked the question, uh, do you still not understand when he explains it? I think that's a clarification question on one part, isn't it? Jesus is interested. Do, do you still not understand? There's emphasis there in, in, in the surprise, do you still not understand? Obviously, you know. But do you still not understand? So Jesus is using questions with his disciples on that level there. And then he continues then in Mark 8, same passage, just all these within the one passage, verse 27. He then says to the people, when he's going through the villages, he says, who do people say that I am? And again, he's using questions. It's a who question. He's asking the how question, how many loaves? He's asking the do you question. He's asking the who do you say that I am? And so you can see how his questions are all around gathering some information. But then he goes on in verse 36 and verse 37. 
In this case, he then asks a sort of a rhetorical question. He says, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? So he's asking questions there. And what, what can you give in exchange for your soul? Very, very open-ended. Hmm, I don't know. What, what can you give? So he's really asking questions to make the person think much more deeply. And, and that's really helpful. He's asking signposting questions. Later on in Mark 10, 3, you don't need to look it up, but he says, what did Moses command? That's a signposting question, isn't it? It's kind of like saying, so what did he say? So he's asking, go back and get, and get that. And rhetorical questions. You know, Matthew says there, which of you by being anxious can add a single art to your life? A rhetorical question, it's only got one answer, but he's still turn it in the form of a question. And I think just looking at the way Jesus asks questions is very helpful for us in us asking questions to other people. It certainly gives us permission, I think, to use it as the method of pastoral care. We began by a young man who wanted to impress people, and he found that questions were the way to do it. He maybe did it for the wrong reason, and it brought a, it brought a pleasing result. I think that for us, learning to ask good questions is much better than learning to say good things, if you think about it. If we can ask good questions, we can really help people. We do need to have understanding to ask the question. So that means that to ask the question, you need to actually have more understanding than the person who doesn't. So it does challenge us to understand life and life under the gospel framework and within the gospel framework so that we can really be Socratic, asking the question, and shepherds who do it with the gospel heart.